Hi, I'm Paul Rosa, and this is the Camelot, birthed in Alameda, California. On board, we're going to have a conversation with John Delancey. Now, you probably know him as Q on Star Trek The Next Generation, or you may have seen him on Days of Our Lives with a host of other TV shows he's been on. Either way, you're going to find out that John is as interesting in person as any of the characters he's played. So, as they say on Star Trek, welcome aboard. You've had a lot of stage experience, haven't you? I started acting when I was about 15, and, uh, and I ended up going to Juilliard, which was all stage work. My father tells me when I was, uh, I was a kid, I was watching something on television, uh, and it was a, a Shakespeare play, and, and apparently I, I kind of really lit up when I saw this particular scene. And I spent a lot of time going to plays when I was a kid. So yes, that was something that, uh, that, that's where the best material is for the most part. There's also a tradition. The, the, the stage has a tradition of work and a tradition of working together that the film doesn't have. And uh, it's important and, um, and it makes for better work, I think. Plays are kind of the gymnasium. That's where the toughest material is. You know, Shakespeare and Shaw and Ibsen and Chekhov and what have you. These are difficult things to be able to, to, to float, to do. And if you can get those, then, then I remember working on that type of material and then my, one of my jobs, a, well, a summer job that I had was with um, Six Rooms Riverview, which is this kind of Neil Simon type thing. I, I just thought it was like, it, it was the, it was the easy, it was so easy. I thought it was going to be so hard, and then all of a sudden I, I got this job, which was, was not all this classical material, which is tough material. It was an easy, fun kind of personality little, little play, and it was fun to do, and it was easy because we had worked so hard on, on difficult material. Part of my job is for you to enjoy yourself, and part of you enjoying yourself is that you feel that I'm having fun. Um, I was, as a kid, really attracted, to, as a lot of other people were, to Errol Flynn. And one of the reasons in which I was so attracted to Errol Flynn is that he had this kind of smile that always made you think that there was something, there was the actor behind there thinking, you know, this is all, this isn't brain surgery, this is just me. Having a goof, having a fun. And I found that very attractive. It's also kind of can be interpreted as being naughty or, or mischievous and things like that. And I think that's important. So I've tried to put that in most everything I do. And the things in which I have not been successful for me have been things in which I've lost that. I mean, part of the, part of the thing that I think helps me is, is that a little bit of that naughtiness. So that's in that. That, that, that I bring to a character. I try to bring. When I watch you as Q, sometimes I think of Dennis the Menace as God. The mechanism that I use is more, uh, you know, an, an, omni an omnipotent being who's too stupid to know it. So it allows me a great freedom in that thing. You know, there's nothing more boring than playing, you know, knowing everything or, or having the power to do everything. So once that's given to the audience, the audience accepts that. It's a, it, it, they're, they're willing to accept it. They've, they've, they've anteed up their money. They want to go. I mean, they, they, you know, they're there for, for entertainment. They're there to, to kind of go with it. And um, with that in mind, you don't have to play that. You don't have to play um, uh, king. Uh, they go, oh, he's, he's a king. Right. They accept it. What they, what, what's fun, then, is, is to see the king with clay feet. Majel Barrett said that she didn't like Christine very much in an interview, the character Nurse Chapel when she played, uh, what she had played in the classic series. And that was really interesting to me. And she went off and really expounded upon why she didn't like this person. She was a loser. She describes her character as a loser. 
And that was really interesting to me because then I thought about her performance and that's what it was. She was always hurting, you know, never quite really there. Um, do you, is it different for you with the character Q? Do you feel like you like Q? Or have you even thought of that? Yeah, I like uh, the character. I, I, I don't think of the character as being separate from me. Um, I, don't, I don't isolate, oh, that's the character, and then the character does certain things. You know, I mean, I know a lot of actors do that. They say, oh, well, my character would never do that. And I always find that to be kind of an odd thing. It's limiting in a way. I, I, I'm, so what I try to do is I set up uh, uh, very wide parameters. I want this character to be as um, unpredictable as possible. So unpredictable as possible means I learn my lines and then I deliver them basically the way I feel like when I got out of bed that morning. You, you know, I mean, I, I, I allow myself that kind of indulgence. Just kind of depends, you know. I, I you know, uh, in one take, uh, you know, Patrick said, you know, he said a line. I got from that, I got, I, I don't know, it just occurred to me that I would mimic him when he back, you know. I mean, I, I, I kind of keep it floaty in that area. So I, I kind of do the way I feel like doing it. And what I have found is that homework Homework is the most important thing to do and to understand what your homework is and to do your homework just like a boxer does their homework. Tell me about that. What, what do you mean? Well, I mean, you know, a boxer trains and they do everything that they need to do. But when they get into the ring, they might have a, a, a they, they do, they have a strategy, a game plan and what have you. But they're also improvising. They're, you know, and they are not bringing their homework. They're not, you know, kind of showing their muscles and how, you know, they're, they're, they are they're moving through what's happening right now mm -hmm. and um, if you do your homework properly you can you you can affect that Th that can be the way in which you work and and that that has a tendency of drawing the audience in in a way that um, performing or performing what you thought you were going to do or what you plotted out to how you were going to do it outside of the arena does not do because that's not what the audience wants to see. If that's where the if that were the case, then you know they they could read read the script. So you better have the tools when you come to the set. You better be rehearsed and have the diction and the techniques and all those things. Exactly. Down. Exactly. And the lines. And cold. the lines. Cold. 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 Colder. Coldest. Um, Chris Reeves. Uh, he he went to Juilliard and. Uh, and when I first came out here, uh, he was working on the, on the same lot that I was, and, and we were talking for, for you know, I said hello and what have you. And I said, so you know, what's what is this this thing called film? You know, TV film. It doesn't make any difference. It's a single camera and it's it's film. And he because we had both gone to Juilliard and we had never talked about the, the, the discussion about film was never talked about at school. And he said, uh, he said, oh, well, I'll tell you one thing. You got to know your lines like. Like you never thought you you needed to know them, because the pressure, the tension, of 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 not rehearsing, and of having to uh, not really rehearsing, and then having you know all these people around, and then having to deliver, is it's a lot of pressure there. So you you cannot have your lines in your head; they have to go down in here so that you're not accessing here. Because otherwise, what you're then watching is actors simply accessing their lines. Right. And they're basically kind of informed readings rather than acting. That's why they don't call it reading. They call it acting. You know, or they don't call it remembering. <laughs> <laughs> now, there's people who would say that going from stage to film, the film actor, that you're giving some of it away, that it's not as prestigious. One of the things about our business, which is unfortunate, is that there's a hierarchy of prejudices that, that kind of make for bad blood back and forth between you know New York and LA and whether you're in TV as opposed to film and whether you're doing commercials as opposed to, I mean and it's all it's all uh, a lot of actors identify their careers by what they don't do and a lot of actors who identify their career by what they don't do don't do very much what are you most proud of there are a few plays that I was I've been very proud of um, um, man and Superman I did Man and Superman, I did uh, Jack Tanner, we did the 
Don Juan section as well. I, I played it with my wife, and I, I'm very proud of that production. Um, I did a play called uh, Child Byron. I played Byron, very proud of that. A play called, um, uh, what is it, Common Pursuit. Very, very pleased about that. I, I also was very happy with, um, with Terra Nova that I did. Uh, that was a good production. Um, movies, um, I thought I did a good job in uh, Hand That Rocks the Cradle. I thought I did a good job. I thought I did a good job in Fearless. I, 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 I think it's a fabulous film. Uh, there was more in it f for me to do, but it didn't get into the film. Um, uh, television. I'm was. I'm very proud of the work in which I did for Days of Our Lives. Uh, I, I really changed the way Days of Our Lives was being done for a while. You know, I was hired to do. I was brought in to do a psychopath for five days, and I took a look at the show. I had never seen the show before, and I took a look at it, and I said, you know, what they want is a psychopath. What they need is a comedian. This show needs a little, like, you know, a little levity. Yeah, a little levity, a little. Let's move it here. Momentum. The momentum. Tempo. Stuff like that. Right. Okay. And, uh, and I went in and I thought, well, you know, there's nothing, there's no rule that says a psychopath can't have a sense of humor. So I went around <laughs> some of, your, some of the being guys psychopathic I know. <laughs> with a sense of humor. And, it, and I was very fortunate because the exec on that show had been kind of the class cut up and um, he appreciated that. And I stayed on that show and I learned a great deal on that show. I learned a great deal. I was able to, you know, just the, the opportunity of repeating and doing and, and, you know, new lines and, you know, well, today went well or today didn't go well. Well, you throw that away and you got another day coming up and you try something else, you try something else. So I learned a lot in that show. And then, of course, uh, Star Trek. I'm, I'm, I'm proud of, of some, of the, um, some of the work on that. Here I am uh, acting at... Uh, at my school. From the age of 15 to about 18, I must have done about at least four Shakespeare's. This was my first play in college. I, um, I, uh, I was thinner. That's mostly what I was. I was thinner and I had more hair. God, I'd like to have both of those things back right now. Let, less, more hair and less weight. <laughs> oh yes, this show. I was playing Amundsen. Uh, it, it was a set that was all in white, and uh, I was the guy who basically got to the North, to South Pole and came back alive. People always ask me where my costumes come from. I, I tell them that I just take them out of my own closet. Here's a show I did with uh, Kathy Bates and Dan and Lemon. It was, it, it was a stage play that we did down in, uh, in Los Angeles. They would try to me make me do these kind of beefcake shots and of course you know I would do it but you know it, I, I would I would do the shot except I would have no pants on so you know it would be this type of <laughs> you know I always have the idea of, you know what's below the frame line you know the, the, I, they would finally they kind of said John you are always skewing the uh, you know the characters here's some of the hilarity of, uh, of us at uh, at, at Juilliard. We were playing a show called Trelawney of the Wells, which is all about, it's a wonderful show about actors, actors in the uh, 19th century in England. I think that the shows in which were the most successful in Star Trek for me were the ones that had to do with larger issues. Um, whether I'm in love with somebody or, you know, so I, it's just, it, uh, who cares? I mean, that's my that feeling. Character, yeah. that's, that's my feeling. Those were not the shows that I felt were were as good, um, but uh, uh, this is a sh this is a character that can can deal with the weight, philosophical weight of uh, of, of of more important issues. If you ask me what my f favorite uh, appearance was uh, for you as Q, it would be on Deja Q, where you lost your power and dealt with that. I thought that was a good one. I loved the speech in the in the turbo lift about uh, bad breath and all those things, and the opportunities to um, be hungry, be tired. I, I think, well, I'll tell you, one of the reasons that that was a good show for no other, for uh, whether the character or anything else, is that good shows are based on, uh, uh, on good, strong through lines. An omnipotent being loses his powers. It's a very strong through line. You know, you can hang a lot. That you can get a real thick clothesline and put a lot of weight on that, and, and, uh, and those are fun. 
uh, you know, shows where does the girl deserve to be a new Q or uh, I don't know. They, they, you, you get a little, it's a little airy fairy at that point. What has B and Q done for you? I mean, what, what are the, what are the uh, artifacts of that character? It has given me c clearly a visibility in a, in a genre that I actually uh, have great respect for, which is science fiction. I love uh, science fiction. And I know that in a way I'll kind of live in this, uh, um, in this little world uh, for a long time, probably far longer than if I had just had kind of a lot of visibility in a television show or something like that, another television show. So it hasn't typecast you? I, I don't think so. I mean, one of the things is, is that the people who do know of, of my work on it mostly have the impression of me being a versatile actor. So I'm hoping that that's going to be the, the, the predominant idea and not just, you know, this kind of high camp guy who it looks like he's in drag most of the time, you know, yeah. who's, you know, so, uh, who knows, look, look, wh what can I do, you know, I mean, it's, it, it's, it's an odd thing, I mean, you know, you, it, it, it's almost like saying if you do a really good job, you're going to get punished by being typecast, so what is the alternative, not to do the good job, you, you try to do as well as possible each time, out. I see you as a character actor with a lot of range, so I don't see how it would be a problem. Yeah, I do think of myself as a character actor. I mean, a lot of people, starting with uh, Hausman and Juilliard, kept on saying, well, you're a lead, be a lead, you're a lead, and stuff like that. I, I like to fracture roles as much as possible. I, I, you know, I just don't think, you know, heroes are, are, are very limited in their, in their responses to things. Um, uh, and villains aren't. So you like being the villain? Well, the villain, for the most part, is the better role. Sherlock Holmes would not be Sherlock Holmes without Moriarty. Right. And uh, and uh, I enjoy I, I enjoy fracturing these things. I enjoy giving a slant to them. And but the, oftentimes people feel that that you know makes it go from a hero to a to a character. But I, you know, I've done love scenes where where the inevitable happens that we as an audience knows are the things that the way they happen and I, I like that you know the little the little twist that that turns it all of a sudden from the you know the, this type of schmutzy schmutzy stuff into into something where you go oh my god <laughs> I've had that happen to me I've, I've experienced that or something like that and I like that so that's where I go are you a scene stealer then I know I know how to steal a scene there are many ways in which you can do it but probably the purest and the one that's the most fun is to really become more involved in the scene. And that type of concentration and that type of energy is very attractive to an audience. It, it's, I, I was teaching just recently and there was a, a, a kid who was throwing uh, darts at a dartboard. Okay, he was miming throwing darts at a dart, dart, dartboard during the scene. I mean, that was just part of the exercise. Well, he totally dominated the scene because he found so many ways to throw darts at that dartboard that finally, you know, you're watching the scene and you're finally like, you know, what is my... And then all of our attention is on this, this, this extraordinary exploration of throwing darts at the dartboard. And it, and it, it be, you, you, the audience loves that. They, they love it. They, they think that's great. Now, you mentioned you've acted with your wife. Yes. Yeah. Tell me more about that. I met my wife when I went up to, in, to Seattle. Uh, actually, I, I, had, uh, I had gone to Seattle to do a show, and I arrived there, and I had rented an apartment with sight on scene. And I got into the apartment, and the landlady showed me the apartment, and just before she left, I said, well, where's, where's the bed? and she pulled it out of the wall. It was a Murphy bed. Now, having grown up with watching, you know, 1940s B-movies, Murphy bed meant pretty down and out. And here it was, a rainy day uh, um, in Seattle, and I'm sitting on the edge of a Murphy bed, and I'm thinking, this is, this is pretty bad. You know, I'm out I'm far from home, and I don't know anybody, and stuff like that. So I went to the theater. Where do I feel the best? I feel best in the theater. So I, I went to the theater and I, I, that, that night. 
And I went there actually because I knew that one of the cast members was going to be in the show that I was going to start rehearsals for the next day. And, uh, and I thought it would be nice just to you know, say, I saw your show last night and stuff like that. And uh, out, uh, it was a Shaw, what was it, uh, Heartbreak House. And out on stage comes uh, this redhead. And she opens the show. And uh, I looked at her and I thought, good speech. Good vocal production moves well. <laughs> it's all this, you know, acting training, you know. Uh, good delivery, yeah. Good attack. Good, uh, oh God, she's kind of pretty too. <laughs> that was my. <laughs> and then I Is it went. Not sounding very romantic. <laughs> no, no, it isn't. It isn't sounding very romantic at all. Then afterwards, I went to see. Uh, Jean Smart was in the show. And I went to, and she was the person who I knew was going to be in the show that I was going to start the next day. And I went backstage and I said to, uh, I, I knocked on the door and I said hello. And I said, Gene, I, I came to see your show. And there was this other person there, this Marnie Mosen. And I said, oh, and you, you know, really, really wonderful show. And we talked for a little while and what have you. And then I left. And Marnie picks up the story by saying she turned to Gene and she said, um, oh, gee. And Gene went, gay. <laughs> <laughs> and Marty went, well, okay, it was like that. And <laughs> but I began, sending, um, I began sending flowers anonymously for about four or five days. And the last bunch that I sent said, uh, you know, if you want to find out who's... I, I think I just named the actor's bar that everybody met at. I just named the bar, and uh, and so we met there afterwards, and and, and then we began, uh, we did a couple of shows up there with each other, and then and then down here, and I just directed her in uh, Private Lives, I, I just did uh, a radio version for uh, LA Theater Works that mm -hmm. gets shown on NPR, or, or aired on NPR, and uh, you have two sons, two boys, two yes, two boys, yeah, seven and nine, is that fun for you? Oh. <laughs> That's, Are they actors? Uh, uh, actually, uh, yeah. Actually, uh, one of them, both of them. Just uh, my wife just did a, a part in a Gary Marshall film, and uh, and they were in that. Um, my oldest played my son in a pilot that I shot, uh, uh, and uh, um, I forget. I think they've been in a couple of other things. So, are you just? Are they genuinely interested? Have you kind of pushed them, or what was? Uh, no, no. I, I, we haven't pushed them at all. Uh, they, they, these are opportunities that they've gotten simply because we're actors, and you know, and they, they get to do it. You know, I've explained to them that, uh, you know, I'm I'm kind of a double threat to the extent that I can direct and I can act. Um, but in this day and age, you need to be at least a triple threat, you know, if you really want to be a good, you know, they, they, should, they should know how to write, they should, you know, do all that type of stuff. So I'm not, I'm not anxious for them to be actors. It, it's not a particularly happy existence. And what's the future hold for you if you could just wave your magic wand? And... The, the, the future is not unlike what it is now, except probably more of it or better of it. I, I, I enjoy teaching a great deal. I don't want to be, I don't, own, I don't want to only teach. I enjoy uh, acting. I enjoy directing. What I even write. Um, I mean, people have been asking me to write comic books of all things. So, you know, all these things are great fun to do. They're fun to do. Uh, if I had to do them as a as a regular thing all the time, they wouldn't be so much fun. This is uh, me in uh, first grade. I flunked out of the school. I think I, uh, I flunked third grade, but they felt sorry for me until they passed me on, but they definitely got me in fifth grade. Uh, there I am, right there. One whose uh, pants are halfway coming down. Oh, here I am here. Um, I think I'm being, uh, well, I don't know, but I have kind of a naughty look on my face. Uh, here I am uh, as a, uh, uh, my father and mother. And uh, I don't know what my mother's looking at. She must be looking at, <laughs> I don't know who she's looking at. But in any case, this was, uh, this was uh, me as a little boy in Philadelphia. 
Here's a very strong image in my life. Uh, I mean, to the extent that, you know, I would go and watch my father perform. And, uh, you know, there he is at the end of a, a concerto that he had played. Um, he was a, uh, you know, so he was the solo oboe player of the Philadelphia Orchestra. Here they are, my, uh, my parents, major um, positive forces in my life. Here's a picture of uh, my wife and I when we were, uh, when, when we, God damn it, when we were younger. Jesus, that's the only thing I can get out of those pictures. This is actually just before filming Star Trek. I, got, I had gotten the job and I was on my way, on my way to uh, Japan. This kid here, Owen, was born three days before. Here's a picture of my oldest son on the set of Star Trek, the first season, where I'm, he is sitting in the captain's chair and I'm explaining to him all the different things that take place. And he was quite fascinated by all that. He has subsequently sat in the captain chair <laughs> seven more times. This is, <laughs> this is a part of my life that we didn't talk about. Uh, I was a wire walker. I walked the wire. Just for fun or what? <laughs> uh, you don't do those things for fun. <laughs> I did this at the uh, Circus Maximus in uh, Las Vegas. Star Trek, which a lot of people think is, you know, it's a culture changing type show. There's a, a lot of very positive things happen from what it is. The little plays that the Star Trek episodes represent, but it's become very commercial. And, uh... Well, I think one of the things that is important about Star Trek is that, it. it First of all, science fiction has always been the bastard child of literature. Science, uh, uh, and then on top of it, here it is, there's a show that's on the syndicated networks instead of the, you know, the, the regular networks and all this type of thing. I, I think that, that Star Trek, uh, the cachet of Star Trek is that it had kind of this cult quality about it. And as it moves for closer and closer to the mainstream, I think it loses some of that cachet. I think that, that, I think that that's important. Um, um, but you know what? It's, it's been embraced now and understood. It's not, you know, it's, it, people don't think of it as a show. They, they call it a franchise. You know, I, I thought franchises were only things that sold hamburgers. Yeah, but I mean, yeah. but you know, they talk about this with all, you know, the Star Trek franchise. Uh, I kind of still like to think of it as a show that, that, that captures the imaginations of, of people who... You know, a, a great example. I, I'm, I'm going to take an airplane uh, somewhere, and, uh, and I'm in, you know, buying a newspaper. And a guy comes up to me and he says, uh, thanks a lot. You've, you've, I've really enjoyed your work on Star Trek. And I said, thank you. And he says, and if you ever want to see the real thing, just give me a call. And he hands me a, a card and walks away. You know, I'm thinking, God, what's this about? And he's the, I don't know what, exactly what his title was, but, you know, something like the, the uh, head of operations for the Titan missile at the Annenberg Air Force Base. Now, uh, for real. Right, so... He wasn't kidding. He wasn't kidding. He yeah. wasn't kidding. You know, there are a lot of people who that show uh, might have been their entry into, you know, 25 years ago. He, the guy was about my age. It's very possible that 25 years ago, that, that was kind of his entry into this whole other area called space exploration. And, you know, and gee, maybe, you know, and, and I think that, it, I, I like the fact that, that those people are still kind of considered, you know, nerdish and all that type of thing. I, I think it's nice to have that niche and not, not have it opened up to just everybody. So There was something kind of fun about the fact that you could only get, you know, the, your Star Trek memorabilia at a convention. Now you can get it at the mall. Now, I don't know if that's better or not. My instinct is, is that it's not. That's, that's it's not as magical. Yeah, right, right, right. I, I think it's I think it's neat that it's that it's uh, that it's you know off you know off on the side here. I think that's kind of fun. Talk to me about the fans. 
What about you've them? Been at, you've been at conventions. Just tell me a little bit about that. Well, one of the things in which I like about a Star Trek convention is that, first of all, it's a club. It's, it's, and all you have to do is ante up with, with an interest in Star Trek. The minute you walk in the door, it spreads out. You can then become inter you, you, you then can carry in your, uh, an interest in computers and movies and f science and fiction and all sorts of other things. It, 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 so the, the ante is only kind of a, a general interest in Star Trek, and it broadens after that. As a club, what I like about it is that it's the only club that I know that's in inclusionary rather than exclusionary. It really kind of has a, this enormous umbrella that brings people in. In that, I have, seen, I have seen more of humanity than I would have ever been able to see, at least as an actor. And, uh, and some of it is very touching, very touching. I, I, I have seen people with physical deformities and physical handicaps and physical limitations that are, uh, 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 they're overwhelming. I mean, they're, they're certainly overwhelming for them and just uh, uh, the empathy that one has for them is overwhelming. I remember waiting to go on and I was hearing a, um, a show, uh, uh, I mean, well, the kind of a trivia contest being done. And I kept on hearing one voice that was answering all these more and more difficult and more specific science facts. And, and after a while, I thought to myself, gee, that, that person's going to win, and they really know their stuff. And I kind of think of myself as somebody who knows their stuff when it comes to science. And, and this person, this woman, was really, really good. But I didn't see her. I came on, did my talk, signed my autographs, and on my way out, the, uh, the promoter said to me, oh, I'd like you to meet the person who won the science, the, 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 the science contest. She was in a wheelchair. The top of her head was, was here, uh, you know, just right, right here. I mean, you know, let's say here. And the bottom, the soles of her feet were right there. And her, uh, 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 it was just somebody that you just thought, my God, this doesn't look like something that would have been on this, on our planet. And yet her mind was so clear. And she and I talked for, 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 you know, 20 minutes or so. And it really forced you to realize there's, there's, you know, beauty, what is it? Beauty is more than skin deep or, you know, there it's, you know, the, Beauty's in the mind of the beholder. Uh, there's Who's this wonderful person. Here, with so much to contribute. I, that's right. That's right. I, I, it would have been just discarded. Uh, somebody would have said, "Oh." And here she could yeah. come and be the star. That's what's extraordinary about. It. And that's what um, Star Trek seems to be a magnet for. Do you think that the money makers can kill that? I think they have a good shot at it. Yeah. That's what scares me. Yeah. That's, uh, that, that's why I, I didn't express myself very well about, the, um, about not making it mainstream. But that's the part that probably would be my, my, my main concern. Talk to me about Gene Roddenberry. Oh, I, you know, my experience of Gene is very limited. Uh, he was very nice with me. And, uh, and I liked him. And I, and I believe that he liked me. I mean, we kind of immediately liked each other. Uh, and, and that wasn't because of the way I met him. You know, I didn't know who Gene Roddenberry was. I, I was not a Star Trek fan. Um, and I was not a television fan when I was a kid. Um, I, I didn't know how to read for such a long time that my parents just simply pulled the, the tubes out of the TV and said, that's it, no more TV, you're going to have to learn how to read. So during, so, and uh, I guess Star Trek came on about that time and I just didn't watch it or, uh, because I didn't, the TV wasn't working. Um, but I did my audition and as I walked out, the second audition that Gene was there, he came up behind me and he put his hand on my shoulder and he said, well, you make my words sound better than they are, which was an awfully nice thing to say. And I said, well, you must be a writer. <laughs> <laughs> you must be one of the writers, right? right? And he said, I'm Gene Roddenberry. I don't know who 
And he said, I think we'll be seeing you. Well, I've been told that before. And uh, then when we started working, he came up again behind me one day and he said, you have no idea what you've gotten yourself into. When people talk about you, what do you want to be in the forefront? Um, well, I would say I would like to be professionally known as a, as a good actor. Um, I, I'm, I'm happy that I've brought uh, at least two roles in the, in the, in the national public's eye uh, to, um, uh, you know, into, into existence, um, hopefully more. When I say that my perception of you is an extremely skilled, practiced actor with a lot of range, who's very good and very fun to watch. That'll do. That's good. I mean, that's... <laughs> I'll, I'll go for that. I mean, what would you say to a young person that's thinking of going into acting that has stars in their eyes? And... Oh, <laughs> about acting? Uh, well, uh, from a snappy thing is, is don't. But, no, I, I would say uh, this was my problem as a kid. Um, I was more often than not out of focus. And I was very... I was very lucky in that my folks, uh, first of all, my father was a, uh, a musician uh, with Philadelphia Orchestra and, and had been very focused when he was very young. And my mother was very focused in the extent that she was involved with antiques all her life. Um, it's really important that uh, people choose not jobs, but careers, and that they identify a career by what it is that they love. And that too often we spend our times in schools talking about, well, do you know this fact and do you know this fact, but people are not helped to find the things that they enjoy. And that to take the risk of, of finding out everything they can about that thing that they enjoy so much, and that if they do it actually well enough, people will start coming to them and paying them to do it and they now have a career and it can be as silly as I mean I, I, I listened on NPR one day about a guy who who he was 85 years old and he said I had the greatest life I've ever had I've collected ants all my life and they kill ants and he goes well, how's that possible I mean why he says well that's what I wanted to do and when my parents asked me when I was you know 15 what do you want to do and he says I want to collect ants and they you know needless to say they were not <laughs> so after several years of therapy yeah. yes, right. and then at 23 you know he still wanted to collect ants but what he did to it to facilitate that is that he invented the ant farm found in Toys R Us's across the country Yes, right, yes, right, and absolutely. I'm, you know, and I'm sure the remunerative rewards were, whether they were high or not, in, in a funny way, it didn't matter. He, he still considered himself a very lucky man. Yeah. You really enjoy what you do, don't you? Yeah, yeah, it's a puzzle. It's a, it's a fun puzzle, and it's a self-exploration. There's just absolutely, I'm looking at my watch and I'm just realizing there's absolutely no way we're going to be able to do this in a day. It's just amazing. You have so much to offer. We're going to have to try and do it. There'll be the part two. two. Volumes. The volume two. The volume two. Two, two three, four, you, the series. You two can buy <laughs> two volumes of me talking endlessly. <laughs> well, before we go, I want to thank Captain Brad Agler and Compass Rose Yacht Charters for use of the Camelot today. I want to thank John Delancey for spending time with us. And most importantly, I want to thank you for watching. I'm Paul Rosa, and I'm looking forward to our next conversation. My pants completely split in the middle of the show and I had to deal with that. That was a pretty good one. On stage at a convention? Or at, on, the, on the set? On the, on, no, on a sh in a show. Oh, in you a know, show. funny, funny, I, I don't believe that funny stories really take place on the set. There are so many people there to stop things right away. Uh, you know, you, you, you miss pour or, or your pants split or something like that. Boy, I tell you, you got, you know, you got you got four tailors, you know, going like this, you know, like that, you know, they're blow drying you. I mean, everything's taken care of right away. The things that, that are fun and funny it really happen on stage because you don't have that and you have to figure, oh, well, how am I going to get through this? Um, um, and we've all had, all, any actor has had experiences like that. Um, 
But right now, the overwhelming sensation that I have is that I have to pee so bad. <laughs> That's right. <laughs>